Hello everyone and welcome in this video sponsored by Skillshare which we will get more into at the end of the video. We are talking about Supernock. How can Supernock destroy modern engines? So we're going to be talking about what is Supernock, what causes Supernock, and are there ways of avoiding it? So why do I say modern engines and why is this a problem that affects newer engines but may not affect older engines? And really it's a probability thing. So modern engines are more likely to have this occur. And why is that? Well, modern engines of course are trying to be as efficient as possible. And in doing so, it is somewhat of an industry trend to move towards downsized, turbocharged, direct injection engines. And these smaller turbocharged engines have very high internal pressures, which means very high internal heats, and this can lead to certain issues. One of these issues being low speed pre-ignition, LSPI. And this occurs in modern engines, uh, often at low RPM, meaning low engine speeds, and at high load, so high throttle. So for example, if you're at a stoplight, taking off from a dead stop, or if you're cruising down the highway in a top gear and you give it full throttle, you're gonna be at a low RPM and a high load, and that's when LSPI could occur, and LSPI could lead to supernock occurring, which could then be quite destructive for your engine. Okay, so let's look at the difference between light knock and super knock. So here we have two identical piston cylinder devices. We're just simply going to have a different sequence of events which occurs, one leading to light knock, which generally won't be that destructive, the other leading to super knock, which can be quite destructive. So with our first cylinder here, we have our you know same four strokes as always, intake, compression, power, exhaust. And so in this first cylinder right here, we have our intake stroke, pulls in the air and fuel, compresses that air and fuel, your spark plug lights, you then have, so that's our first step, is igniting that air fuel mixture from the spark plug. You then have that flame propagation as that flame travels outward, expanding the pressure within the cylinder. Now, as it expands that pressure within the cylinder, another pocket, perhaps there's a hot spot somewhere within this cylinder, gets hot enough, the pressure of and the temperature within of that air fuel mixture within the cylinder is now hot enough as a result of that hot spot being near it that you now have knock occur. So you have this combustion event which is not triggered by the spark plug but instead by the heat and pressure and perhaps a hot spot within the cylinder. So this leads to a chaotic uh, amount of you know pressure waves running into each other and it's not ideal combustion but because it's occurring after the spark plug has already fired generally speaking it's not all that destructive it's just something that you want to avoid and so you know this can occur in engines uh, and you may not even hear it you may not even notice it and the engine will correct for it to make sure that it doesn't happen uh, by adjusting air fuel ratios by adjusting timing Supernock, on the other hand, can be quite destructive. And so what's happening, you have that intake stroke, you now have your compression stroke, and before your spark plug ever fires, you have a hot spot somewhere in this cylinder. Something causes ignition to occur. So, you know, that could be an oil droplet, it could be a carbon deposit, uh, something within this cylinder. And again, it's not actually fully understood what is always causing this pre-ignition to occur, uh, but this is that LSPI event, low speed pre-ignition, so that's step number one and it doesn't necessarily mean that damage is going to occur yet it's not necessarily destructive just because you have LSPI occurring so then from that little hot spot, of course, the flame is going to start to travel outward and expand and the pressure within this cylinder, again, continues to increase. Then as a result of that increased pressure and temperature within the cylinder, now other areas within the cylinder are hot enough that they can combust all on their own. And so that's that super knock event. And so all of this is combustion is occurring uh, before your spark has fired so you don't have ideal timing. You're not in control of when that high pressure occurs. So let's say, for example, uh, you know, you could have this expanding outward, this flame travel, and then you could have your spark plug fire, and then eventually everything could work out and it could be just fine. But let's say your piston's on its way up during that compression stroke, and now you're having all of that combustion occur as that piston is moving up. So you've got these two counter forces. The pressure from the expansion from combustion is trying to push that piston down. The piston is being forced up by the crankshaft. Of course, those two things cannot happen simultaneously. One of them has to give. Uh, either this has to be able to deal with the pressure or something breaks. And so connecting rods and pistons can often fail if this scenario pans out where you have that really high pressure not at the ideal time to push that piston down and turn it into useful work and so if you look at a graph of cylinder pressure 
versus your crank angle. Essentially, this is time on the bottom, and then we're looking at pressure within the cylinder. So you want normal combustion is what we have here in red. So you want to fire that spark plug. Of course, the pressure starts to rise as that piston compresses the air fuel mixture. Then you want the spark plug to fire. Your flame starts to expand outward and then it eventually expands out fully, burning all of that air and fuel and you get your peak in pressure and then it pushes that piston down and that pressure is turned into useful work. Now with light knock, you'll see, you know, similar to uh, the regular combustion, except you're going to have that pressure increase a bit more rapidly and a bit more chaotically. So you'll have these kind of pressure waves, not ideal for it to occur, it's inconsistent, it's not as predictable. And then super knock, you're no longer in control of timing. So, you know, your spark plug is firing after combustion is already starting. Uh, so unfortunately, you're not in control of what happens. And you get these really high pressure spikes um, and it's quite chaotic and it can be quite destructive, uh, you know, especially depending on the timing that it occurs. It can occur too early and then you're having those fighting pressure waves. Even if it's occurring a bit later, you will still have peak pressure at unideal times as that piston is moving downward uh, and you can have chaos occur within the cylinder and really destroy uh, those uh, pistons as well as your connecting rods. So certainly not ideal to have this scenario play out, which generally is a result of low speed pre-ignition uh, and generally occurs at low RPM and high load in modern engines. Now, if we know that superknock as a result of LSPI is most likely to occur at low engine speeds and high engine loads, well then why don't we just tune that out of the system? Why don't we just say, you know what, modern engines, generally speaking, they're all using electronic throttle bodies, so why don't we just reduce the amount of throttle that you can possibly give to an engine at lower RPM? That way you don't have to run into these high load, low RPM scenarios. And in fact, that is done by manufacturers and they will tune uh, that low RPM so that they minimize load in order to prevent LSPI from occurring. But that's a bad solution. And the reason why it's a bad solution is because if you look at a map of an engine's brake specific fuel consumption, meaning how much fuel is required to make a specific amount of power, then you will notice that the most efficient area, this area I've drawn in green here, occurs at low RPM and high engine load. So the most efficient region that you can operate an engine also happens to be the engine where it's most likely to run into low speed pre-ignition. So obviously you want to try and minimize uh, tuning out this region because that's the region, the whole reason you're moving towards, you know, these small turbocharged engines that are more prevalent of having these problems is to increase efficiency. So if you then have to avoid the efficient region, well, then you're doing yourself no good. Uh, so overall, you need to find a better solution other than just tuning the throttle in order to avoid super knock. So if we don't use engine tuning to avoid this problem, what can we do about it? Well, to answer that question, we need to better understand the root problem. And again, this isn't something that's fully understood. We don't know what always causes this pre-ignition to occur, but one thing that has been linked to it, as in increasing the probability of LSPI occurring, is the motor oil's composition. And so how does the motor oil get within your cylinder? Well, there's multiple ways that it can get in there. You have oil that is coming down your valve guides. It could leak down the valve and eventually make its way into the cylinder. You have your positive crankcase ventilation system, which could allow oil mist to then be introduced within the cylinder. And of course, you have those oil squirters, which are using uh, squirting oil on the walls of the cylinder. And so those pistons could introduce that oil through the walls up and into your cylinder. And so these, this oil's formulation can have an effect on LSPI occurring. And so the American Petroleum Institute has created uh, a new version, a new specification, uh, their latest motor oil specification, API SN+. And within this specification, uh, they have LSPI testing, which oils have to pass in order to get this API SN+, label. And so I was actually talking with some engineers at Valvoline and saying, hey, how are you guys able to change your formula to allow uh, for it to you know, prevent LSPI from occurring and pass this LSPI testing? And one of the interesting things they said was that one of the problems uh, has been related to calcium being within oil formulas. 
And so they said calcium is often used in detergents. So your detergent will have a polar head and a hydrocarbon tail. And the goal of this detergent is to prevent deposit precursors from sticking to, you know, metal surfaces within the engine itself. You don't want those deposits. You rather keep them uh, within the oil itself and then filter them out using the oil filter. So these detergents have a polar head, uh, which could be made with calcium, uh, sodium, magnesium, and what Valvoline said uh, in their testing, by switching to a detergent that uses magnesium as its head rather than calcium, they incredibly reduced uh, the amount of LSPI that it was occurring. And so they were able to pass this LSPI testing by changing the formulation of the detergent they were using uh, to, from a calcium base to a magnesium uh, head. And that was able to you know, have those better results where they weren't seeing LSPI occur as frequently as it was with calcium. Now, as I've already mentioned, there are multiple causes of LSPI and it's not fully understood. So we can't put the entire blame and the entire solution on motor oil. That said, if you are running a modern engine and you are concerned about whether or not you may have LSPI occurring, one of the things you can do to help prevent that, to reduce your probability of running into LSPI, is by using a motor oil that is API SN Plus certified. Now again, a big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. There's a link in the video description and the first 500 of you to sign up using this link will get two free months of membership. Now obviously I spend a lot of my own time learning and teaching. That's what this channel is all about. But I also spend a ton of my time creating. And that's really where Skillshare as a platform shines. It's an online learning community designed for creators whether you're just about to start out or well into your career. Whether it's photography, video editing, script writing, animating, or even the more business-oriented side of being a creator. And they have thousands of classes to help you learn new skills and apply them in the real world. Again, you can sign up using the link in the video description, and the first 500 will get two months free. If you have any questions or comments, of course, feel free to leave those below. Thanks for watching.